Okay, it's time to talk about integration. Of course, integration is a vast topic, but it won't take us too long to talk about it because our tasks are very focused. We have two tasks. One consistent with the goal of all of sensor calculus, which is translate invariant notions into coordinate representation. So we'll talk about invariant integrals first, and then how to represent them in terms of arithmetic operations. And of course, arithmetic integration, like we learn it in ordinary calculus. So it's just that bridge that interests us now. And then we'll talk about, of course, the fundamental theorem of integration, which is Gauss's theorem, or the convergence theorem. Uh, it's really an equivalent of the fundamental, it's not an equivalent, it's a slight generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus, a very natural one. And I'll just state what it is without proving it. And then we'll, I'll show you three very, very nice, vivid applications of the convergence theorem. Of course, excuse me, if I've been saying convergence theorem, I've been wrong, divergence theorem, <laughs> of the divergence theorem, or Gauss's theorem, divergence theorem. Okay, three very striking, vivid applications of the divergence theorem, which of course is the one and only theorem in integration uh, in Riemann spaces. And uh, everything else, Stokes theorem, Green's theorem, and so forth, are just straightforward consequences of the divergence theorem. Okay, so let's begin by talking about integration. So what is, again, First, we focus on an invariant geometric concept, and then its representation and coordinates. So at first, we don't have any coordinates. We just have a closed domain omega. When you have a closed domain omega and some invariant field f, it could actually be a vector field, but it has to be an invariant field. It's invariant in the sense of tensor calculus. Invariant field scalar or tensor defined on this domain. Then you can define its invariant integral. And I could say all of the words that you hear when talking about the definition of integral. So it's really conceptual. Nobody evaluates the integral this way. But the idea is, excuse me, is to break up this domain into small patches for small, no, well, in this case, small segments, small segments of space, small rectangles perhaps, or rectangles with curved corners, or just rectangles, and you ignore the rectangles that are near the boundary. And you just multiply any value of the invariant field f by the volume of that little rectangle, and then all you add all of them together and go to the limit. And that's the definition of this invariant uh, integral. It's the total f contained in this domain. By the way, this domain, I tried to draw it as a three-dimensional domain, but maybe it's a two-dimensional domain, works just as well. And even in the one-dimensional domain. Okay, so that's the invariant definition. I don't want to dwell on it. Hopefully you've thought about all of these issues when you were studying calculus, but I think you should have an intuitive understanding of what the integral, what the invariant integral means. And you can follow a similar procedure for surfaces. So here I have a surface patch, a field, an invariant field F defined on it, could be vectors, could be scalars. And to define this invariant integral over a patch S, it's denoted like this. Uh, again, you break it up into small patches. Uh, presumably, we have an intuitive understanding of what the area of a small patch is. Multiply that area by any value of the invariant field on that square or on that patch. Add them all together, take it to the limit as patches shrink. And that's the invariant definition of this integral. So these integrals could theoretically be evaluated without any reference to a coordinate system. If you're patient enough, we keep breaking up the space into finer and finer pieces, evaluating the finite sum, and somehow taking the limit to infinity. Obviously, it's very conceptual, but that's the idea. Now, the big question in tensor calculus, and I'll just give you the answer. The proof of everything I talk about is in the book. There are largely um, conceptual proof, excuse me, there are technical proof. They're all there in uh, sufficient detail in my textbook. I just want to capture the big picture now. So how do we express this integral algebraically, analytically, if you will, or arithmetically is an even better, is an even better term? Well, the answer is written right here. Once you introduce a coordinate system, zi, 
in the entire ambient space, then f becomes a function of zi. Depending on your choice of coordinates, this will be a completely different function. We've discussed this many times before. And in every coordinate system, you can evaluate the volume element. Of course, it's not an invariant. It's not a tensor. It's a variant uh, of, of relative weight one. So everything here changes. And then, of course, you have to take a repeated integral. First, you integrate with respect to z1. Then you get the result you integrated with respect to z2. And you take the result you integrated with respect to z3. And the limits of integration are such that the, the domain is properly captured. So for example, in 2D, if this was a circle and we were in polar coordinates, then r would go this. Then r would go from 0 to the radius, and theta would go from 0 to 2 pi. If we were in Cartesian coordinates, then uh, let's say the outer one would go from minus 1 to 1. That would be y. And x would go from minus square root of 1 minus y squared to positive square root of 1 plus minus 1 squared. So it's a wordy uh, definition, but just keep in mind that the limits must be such that uh, the, the domain is properly captured. And as long as that's true, and you have thought about the plus or minus sign very carefully, this becomes an invariant expression. The result does not depend on your choice of coordinates. So this is your invariant representation of this geometric definition. So geometric definition, invariant analytical representation. So a success as far as tensor calculus is concerned. And also gives you the, the, a good interpretation of what this symbol means. Just imagine that f equals 1. Then all you have is area or volume in this case. So that's why this is called the volume element. It really tells you the volume, that coefficient of proportionality you should use when uh, the volume is such that it's described by elementary changes as z1, z2, and z3, or infinitesimal, if you will. Uh, the same thing happens on the surface. This is a geometric type of thing. On the right, we have its analytical representation. Once you choose a system of coordinates on the patch, f becomes a function of those coordinates. Maybe I should have used a different letter, g, but same letter denotes a totally different function, perhaps. Uh, you have to multiply it by what's now called an area element for those same reasons. The sd1, it's a repeated integral. You first do s1, then you do s2. And once again, the limits need to be such that the domain is properly kept. So that actually completes the first part of our discussion, which is how do you translate the integral into an analytical expression that you can actually evaluate in any given coordinate system. And that in all coordinate systems, it would yield the same numerical result. And here's how you do it, and why this work is explained in the textbook. So now let's pause or maybe stop this video, start another, and then we'll talk about the glorious divergence theory. Thank you very much.